uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and, and we're going to be reading from verses 12 through 20. It seems a bit strange, but our, our theme this morning is that you are bought with the price. And uh, the three headings, if you want them, are pleasure in what is seen, pride in your own opinion, and peace in your heart. I will be saying those again, but for those who are taking notes, it's sometimes helpful to have those at the start. <coughs> Let me start by telling you a wee story. There's a little boy who was really excited because a neighbour um, had a cat and the cat had kittens. And uh, he pestered his dad and pestered his dad. So his dad said, all right, come on, we'll go and look at the kittens. So on Saturday morning off they went to their friend's house and they saw the kittens. Well, they came in. You can imagine what it was like. He ran in the door to tell his mum. And there she was um, doing what women do, I suppose, doing a bit of baking or something. And baby runs in and he says, oh, mum, it was great. It was great. <clears throat> she said, what was good about it? He said, there were two boy kittens and two girl kittens. She said, and how did you know there were boys and girls? She says, well, Daddy picked them up and looked underneath. I think it's printed on the bottom. <laughs> <laughs> See, innocence and propriety are gifts that we should treasure. Our children are not children for very long, are they? And sadly, there's too much in this world, even that which masquerades as right and just, that seems determined to spoil that which is good. And you know, humanity just can't seem to help itself, can it? And I suppose that's where your first heading comes in, pleasure in what is seen. The culture in Corinth was, it was given over to the worship of physical pleasure. Let me just read for you verse 12 to 20. Everything is permissible for me, but, everything, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and stomach for the food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of, of, Christ, of, of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never! Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her body? For it is said the two will become one flesh. But he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins that a man, a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your body. This worship of physical pleasure continued and the priestesses of uh, Aphrodite of the temple of Aphrodite would come down into the streets at night and they would ply their trade and it was quite all right to do that so sexual promiscuity was accepted and actually it was highly regarded and looking at our own society we can see how quickly that sort of philosophy can gain so much ground can't we you haven't got to travel far from here to see it you know I read this week did you know the worship of Aphrodite, Aphrodite actually continues today that's a bit of a surprise, isn't it? Well, I did a bit of research. It didn't take me too long, but Google's a great research tool, isn't it? And although they're not so extrovert in their practices anymore, they still maintain the focal point on sexual pleasure. And it's hopeful, it's hopeful of a revival. Um, one of the most recent writers said that, they're, that now that the persecution that they've suffered over the millennia from Islam and from Christianity is getting less and less, um, and seeing that, um, seeing that these things are happening, they're hoping to promote their cause, and they reckon that the Christian church is in its death throes. That's a very interesting view, I thought, but that's written not so long back. People believe that. After the church was co in Corinth was planted, the teaching on propriety and family and relationships and family values and integrity, respect for others, all came into conflict with what was seen as normal in normal behaviour in their society. And so the church was up for a challenge straight away. The challenge to a promiscuous lifestyle was, was viewed as subversive, actually. 
And in some churches, they even took issue with the Apostle Paul. And some people even said that Paul himself had taught the truth that laid the groundwork for viewing some of the sexual practices that were going on as being right and proper for Christians even. And it's incredible, really, that here we are again in history with the pressure on us and putting us in it, trying to push us into a, into a position where we relax our attitudes according, and, and looking at varying sexual practices and putting us in a corner almost, making us choose almost. And if we disagree, then we're clearly narrow-minded and we lack love somehow. The right to opinion is being eroded to the point where to disagree with a viewpoint or a lifestyle is the possibility now of being under threat of prosecution. And what's worse than this is that many relaxed sexual viewpoints have actually crept into the church and the excuse is, well, we're only human after all. And so the general picture is far from consistent and the picture presented to a broken world is of a church that is just as broken. I'm not talking about individual groups here, I'm talking about the whole picture of the Christian church. And so the, the quote from the Aphrodites seems to make some sense. If they're saying it, some bizarre group are saying that, what is the world in general saying about the Christian church? You see, that's pleasure in what is seen. That's what it does to you, because if you go your own way, you become no different to anyone else. But then there's pride in our own opinion. Look at verse 12. This is them having an opinion. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Now, note, first of all, there are quotation marks in the text here. Now, I love this passage, actually, because Paul's a bit like a boxer coming out of his corner. And the reason I say that is because he's not just swinging, but he's like a boxer who's being very strategic. You know, a boxer, when he comes out, I don't know, how many people like boxing here? I see, well, you know what it's like then, don't you? That's something to get passionate about, eh? <laughs> anyway, and you've watched a boxer come out, and as he comes out, he's keeping his guard up, he's keeping himself covered, because what he's got on the other human being is a target area. He's not just concentrating on knocking him out. He'd like to do that, but actually it's all about scoring points. So if he hits him on the arm, he gets a point. If he hits him on the head, he gets more points. If he hits him on the body, he gets particular points. And particular kinds of blows. And so Paul is being very wise and strategic when the way he deals with them. I, I was sorry, I was thinking about wisdom there, and I was thinking about the, the angel that appeared, you know, in, in a, a faculty meeting at a big university. And the guy in charge um, was a bit shocked, and he had the whole faculty around him, and the angel says to him, the Lord has decided that because of your unselfish and exemplary behavior, he will reward you with the choice of infinite wealth, infinite wisdom, or infinite beauty. And without hesitation, the guy in charge says, oh, well, I'll take wisdom. Done, says the angel, and he disappeared in a cloud of smoke. Everything went quiet, and he sat down. And everyone looked at him for about five minutes. They all looked at him, and someone said to him, say something. And he said, I should have taken the money. <laughs> 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 wisdom is the reward you get for a lifetime of listening when you would have preferred to talk. Paul, you see, doesn't kick off and start attacking their illicit behavior that's going on in the church. What he does is first to con confront the theology on which they're basing their behavior. Everything is permissible for me. This was a, a bit of a slogan or a catchphrase used in the Christian church. <coughs> Look, he says, everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. And of course everything is permissible for me, but it will, I will not be mastered by anything. They were, in effect, trying to twist Paul's words in his teaching on freedom from within the grace of God. Paul said, we're no longer under the law. Under the law, we're no longer bound to it or bound to idols. We're not bound to fear because in Jesus we have been set free. That is the truth. This freedom, though, is not a license to do as you please, but the liberty to be who we're meant to be. It's too easy for us to use this answer, says Paul, but it doesn't actually make much sense. The law says we must not murder, steal, commit adultery, covet, etc. Freedom from the law doesn't give you license to go and do these things. That's kind of a, a spiritual anarchy. 
Rather, the freedom that Jesus brings enables us by the Holy Spirit to embrace the truth of the law. Understanding that it's not what we do that makes a difference, but who we are. And what we ultimately do in our behaviour is a result of who we are. The big difference, of course, in layman's terms, is that legalism, certainly from a Christian perspective, holds us in a framework that allows no manoeuvre, saying, for example, that unless a position or behaviour can be proved in a Bible verse, then it's wrong. And this negative approach then robs us of our peace because we're focusing so hard we lose our objectivity. It robs us of our joy because we're always looking over our shoulder and it robs us of our creativity and colour because this is the way we've always done it and this is the way it'll always be done. And the Holy Spirit, well, you'll just have to do as he's told, won't he? True New Testament Christianity, on the other hand, says that this is God's creation, we are his children, and life is meant to be lived to the full with all the originality and all the resourcefulness that you and I can muster. And so our exploration, our discovery, and our subsequent behaviour should be governed by what God says in his word. Do you see the subtle difference there? Legalism says that this is how it's done, and this is how the scriptures fit. Freedom says, with God's help, I will be the best me that I can be, and his word will govern my behaviour. And this is relationship and true to participation in the divine nature. I've said it again. Everything is permissible. Of course it is, says Paul. I said it myself, but not everything is beneficial. And remember, people, you're not in this alone. What about Jesus and your decisions? And what about the rest of the body, the church? To be mastered by anything other than truth is just folly. Because, you see, the path of liberty is fantastic. There's so many benefits, but there are times when there is so much pressure to compromise that you feel a bit like a tightrope walker as you've gone along tight and the wind's blowing you. I don't know if you've heard of Nick Wallander. He's a famous tightrope walker, actually, and he walked across the Niagara Falls. Mm. He actually got very upset with the, with the media because when he planned to do the, um, the walk, um, he did a, a stunt beforehand and it was at some high buildings or something and he faked a fall and it terrified the networks and they said, look, if he falls, he could die on television. We don't want that to happen. So they made him wear a harness and he was not happy when he walked across the Niagara, although he did it. But he says a very interesting thing about tightrope walking. He says, you're trying to find a focal point. Something steady to walk towards. Every time you place a foot on a wire, it creates a vibration that sends a ripple down to the end and back again. It's a perpetual frequency of waves. And the only way to stop the waves is to stop moving. But movement keeps you centered. If you stop moving, you'll eventually fall. And you're perpetually aware of that fact as well. So make the connection to your spiritual journey here. Sometimes it gets really hairy, doesn't it? And all we want to do is stop. But if we stop, we're going to lose our focus, aren't we? And we're going to fall. So we've got to keep moving. And that is what faith is about as light comes to the next step. And the next step. And the next step, but you focus on the purpose of God. You see, the moment we lose our focus, we move from liberty to legalism. And the interesting thing is that the things and the behaviour that cause us the most harm and distraction are those things with a habit forming. Because actually we get a degree of pleasure from them, don't we? Now I'm not just talking about things like drinking and smoking and things like that. I'm talking about other people. I'm talking about the company that we keep. The places that we go, the lengths that we will go to justify that, to make that a priority in our life. And Jesus, well, Jesus is in the mix somewhere, but he's certainly not the master of your life. And so many Christians, we all do it. We justify ourselves time and time again. And because we have a reputation for being alive and keen Christians, we rely on that and not on the fact that we are alive. We imprison ourselves and we're saying to the Lord, I don't need your help here. And we're saying to the fellowship around us, actually, I'm the one who's important in this room. Look at verse 13. 
food for the stomach and stomach for the food. But God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. Now, cleverly, what Paul is doing is actually is dismantling their argument. You see, like us, the Christians in Corinth, they could justify absolutely anything. So, for example, if you don't fancy coming to church, you make that decision. And then what you do, and don't tell me you don't do it because I do this, well, I've done it, okay? What you do is you then find something else to do as a sort of a justification to yourself. It also has the benefit of giving you another reason for when someone says they missed you at church, you say, well, actually, I had this to do. And then you're quite satisfied in your own mind that you've got away with that, so actually missing the odd Sunday it really doesn't do any harm at all, does it? No one missed me, we say. You know, it's really daft because we know that actually the fellowship is important for our spiritual survival. We know that we need each other and we're really just kidding ourselves on. We know that. We know that each of us has a responsibility to care for each other. You can't do that if you're not here. See, the danger with that kind of logic is that it leads us into more obvious errors. Now, the Corinthians, they were less than subtle. They were enjoying their sin, all right, but they wanted a foot in both camps too. Food for the stomach, stomach for the food, they would say. So what they were saying is, look, if you're hungry, you go to the cupboard, you get something to eat. So therefore, if you have a sexual craving, you can go and fulfil that need as well, because it's a need of your body, isn't it? You know, it's laughable, isn't it, that this kind of existential hedonism, it's rife today even, particularly amongst our young. They crave the boundaries. But at the same time, they see sexual conquest almost as a rite of passage. And it's important to see here that the scriptures meet us exactly where we are. And they answer even our strangest thought processes so that we know that the Lord has got things covered. Look, he's saying, there's a distinct difference between your digestive system and your physical being. If you eat the wrong things, then your system can really be upset. Who's had a bad curry here? Right, you know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? Sitting on a loo with your head in the sink. It's not nice, is it? When you commit sin with your body, and in this case, sexual immorality, then you've, not, you've got to live with your conscience. See, God has got a purpose for us that goes far beyond any temporary gratification. There's going to be a day, you know, when there'll be no need for, stomach, for the stomach or for food. Our bodies, our physical identity has a forever meaning in God's economy. It contains our soul and it actually expresses who we are. See, pleasure in what is seen is one thing. Pride in our own, own opinion is another. But peace in your heart is a whole different matter. Look at verses 14 to 16. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will raise us also. Do you not know that your, member, that, that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them to a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with a body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh. What a terrible waste, says Paul. Gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature when we can know as part of the holy dance the beauty of, beauty of eternal life right now. This represents a dignity of humanity above the animals. It reveals a difference. It's not about genetics. It's not about behavioural ethics. It's about our true identity as the children of God and in that participation in relationship to the divine nature we have, as one writer puts this, listen to this, a capacity within us to fuse with the very nature of God so that there is no distinction left between us and him as to our identity. That is incredible. Now, says Paul, who wants to talk about their dinner? See how relevant their argument is? It's no relevance at all. It's a piece of nonsense. And he's using my soldier phrase there, really, although I probably didn't know that phrase then. Get a grip. See, here we see the basis of the truth of the scripture and the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
the accessibility, the availability of the presence of God to every believer so that every challenge we face, whether that be good or bad, can be met with a new power and an ability to resist and understand and see in a way that we never did before. See, when we're born again by the Spirit of God, this is, in the, this is the inward change that we, was promised to us. And the outward expression should just be inevitable. But he who unites himself with the Lord, verse 17, the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your body. You know, it was a man called Josh McDowell, fantastic um, apologist. He says, if in doubt, chuck it out. I love that. I keep that as a motto. That's exactly what Paul is saying here. If you're in a compromising position, that could be a physical position. It could be through literature, it could be through the internet, it could be through TV. Get away from it. Don't start justifying it, thinking that, well, I will resist the devil and he will flee from me. Don't put yourself in a line of fire. Don't be a wally. And if you think that's a weak response, and response, then just look around you in a society at the broken lives that there are. There's more than enough evidence of the subtlety of the evil forces that are all around us and are really active. And because our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit, we have a capacity, because we are intimately connected to the greatness and the majesty of God, to hold on to him. Have you ever thought about that? We talked this morning as we began to about the beauty of God, about the creative children that he has created. That's who we meant to be. We are the children of God. If that is true, then we have access to the divine. The point is that all of this grace and mercy, all of this new life, all this eternity, this presence of God is a gift as we receive as he owns us, as he clothes himself with us. Every Christian believer needs to grasp this with both hands, understanding that we have no right to our own being. We belong to the Lord. That doesn't mean he makes us a bunch of robots. People who can't think for themselves. There are decisions to be made that only each of us can make. Our capacity for choice is not controlled in any way. But we need to be aware that each of us will be accountable for the decisions that we make. Of course, God himself reserves the right because he is sovereign and because we belong to him by right of creation and of course by purchase in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. He reserves the right to number our days. And to allow us to be different in different places at different times. He knows the purpose of both trouble and blessing. And being the loving father that he is, he sees to it that we are the best. Granting guidance and knowledge that belong only to him. I read another lovely story of a little boy who wanted to go to his friend's birthday party. And it was just a couple of blocks along. And it was snowing terrible. And... Uh, his dad looked at the weather and said, look, it's a bit of a blizzard out there, you know. Even the gritter's not out. I don't think you should go. And he said, but dad, everyone else is going to be there and I'm really looking forward to it. Reluctantly, his dad said, all right, you can go. So the boy was chuffed a bit. He's got his kit on and off he went. It took him half an hour to get to the party. And he rang the bell and he stood there like a snowman. And I opened the door and let him in. And he looked around and he saw a shadowy figure. His dad had followed him all the way to make sure he got there all right. And that's exactly how our Heavenly Father is with us. So the law stood before us, says someone. Stood before us as a barrier, an impossible barrier that we could not get over, around or under. Then Jesus came and placed his body on the cross, took the guilt of our sins into his own body and formed the bridge through the law that we might enter into the kingdom as clean and renewed children of God. What more do we need to convince us to hold on? What more do we need to face the challenges with confidence to trust him even though we doubt at times? Because, you know, there's nothing else. He takes the responsibility to love us, 
the responsibility to guide us, the responsibility to save us from ourselves. You know, we're bought with only what God himself could provide. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Let's pray together, shall we? We're so conscious, our Heavenly Father, that we don't belong to ourselves. And as we read these accounts in the Scriptures and we think about the Corinthian church, we see ourselves mirrored there. Because like them, we justify our behaviour and we make these decisions because it suits us and it doesn't suit you or the church. We thank you that everything is permissible. But we know that everything is not beneficial. We don't want to be mastered by anything that is negative or unreal. But we want to be the free, objective, creative children of God you intended for us to be. So grant us the faith we need, we pray, to please you. In Jesus' name. Amen.